Hello, welcome to York Street. We hope that this sermon will be an inspiring and impactful one, just what you need at this time. For any of our sermon-based studies, please head to our website at www.yorkstreet.com.au. So grab a cuppa, grab your notebook, whatever you need, and we hope that you enjoy the sermon. Well, good morning, everyone. It's my privilege to share with you again today. Um, it'll be Tim next week. <laughs> I just wanted to start by saying, when Jesus preached, the options of everyone there listening changed. Have you ever noticed that? Go back and have a look. Last week, we began our series on the Beatitudes. And if you weren't here last week, can I encourage you to go back and listen to that message because it will help you to make sense of everything else that's shared for the next couple of months. Um, we're inviting you on a journey and the journey is going to be better for you if you've got that foundation laid. So you can find it on our website. You can find it on YouTube. Um, here's a really quick revision, but please don't rely on this if you weren't here last week. The Beatitudes are the entry point to the Sermon on the Mount, which has some of the most important teachings of Jesus all neatly in one place. And you can find that starting in Matthew chapter 5. Last week, we saw that Jesus had come onto the public stage in Matthew chapter 4, and he began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Some versions of the Bible use the words, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Those of you who were here, do you remember the hand thing? Look at your hand. It's really quite close, isn't it? So the kingdom of heaven is very close. Jesus started traveling around the whole area then and he was teaching and he was healing and news about him spread, which I guess isn't surprising because he was doing the miraculous and changing people's lives and people were flocking to him from everywhere. So who were those people? We saw in that culture that they were the unimportant, the insignificant, the hurting, the sick, the poor, the deprived, the deficient, the spiritually destitute, those who were pushed to the absolute margins of society. They had no voice and no power. So having ministered to the needs of these people crowding around him, Jesus then wanted to teach them. So he moved up to a higher place up on the hill where they could hear and see him well. And then in the midst of this mass of raw humanity, with them hanging on every word, and with the show and tell around him of people who had just been healed and had a touch from heaven, Jesus then taught about the availability of the kingdom of God. And in the opening lines of his sermon, Jesus radically redefined who is blessed around the least likely candidates. And he said this, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. What a strange, odd, very controversial and brilliant way to begin a sermon. If you're new to Jesus and the readings of the New Testament and you're hearing this or reading this for the first time, you're possibly think, thinking, like, what? Like, Jesus, are you out of your mind? There's nothing on that list that seems particularly good to me. And what's so surprising is who Jesus calls fortunate. At that time, people assumed that only the wealthy or the attractive or the powerful were blessed. Poor, sad and suffering people were actually thought to be cursed. Yet with the words that Jesus is using here, he seems to be affirming everything about these people. And he's taking those who, from a human point of view, are thought to be the furthest away from God's blessing and lifting them up as an example of God's touch. And he's sharing about the availability of the kingdom beyond all existing assumptions. We also unpacked the word blessed, kind of important that we know what that one means throughout this series. It's the word makarios in the Greek, 
And we landed at the place where this word blessed, makarios, even though we don't quite have an equivalent for it in English, is kind of like saying, congratulations, blessed are you, happy are you, fortunate are you. Jeff Barlow came to me after the service last week and said, I came to the conclusion in his studies at some stage that it also meant fulfilled are you. So that was a great one to add in there. Can you imagine Jesus making these statements in this crowd, locking eyes with a beggar and saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, or with a grieving widow who's now extra vulnerable and saying, blessed are those who mourn. Jesus is saying to them, Makarios, congratulations, over and over again, like it really is a bizarre list. It's really quite radical. The only way to make sense of these list of blessings of Jesus is through the lens of the kingdom of God. Otherwise, Jesus is out of his mind. I mentioned last week that the kingdom of God is both complex and really simple. Its complexity is found in its mysteries, its simplicity in the way that we discover it by putting our hand in the hand of Jesus and following him. So let me add an extra layer to that this week. I didn't want to overload you last week. One of those mysteries of the kingdom of God and something that we need to try and wrap our heads around is that the kingdom of God is both a present reality and a future hope. Theologians call it the now and the not yet. So tuck that one in the back of your minds as we travel through today. And today we're going to jump into the second beatitude. I wonder if you've noticed yet that graphic of the stained glass window. It's been deliberately chosen. And even though we'll be looking at one um, blessing each week, we want to invite you to think about them not as separate entities, but as part of a bigger picture, like a stained glass window. Each part contributes to the whole picture, and you can actually view each one in the light of the others. And when you look at them all together, you realise how they fit together in a beautiful portrait. So here's the second piece of the window. Matthew 5, 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This beatitude flows out of being poor in spirit, which is the beatitude we looked at last week. And Jesus says to this crowd on the hill that they are blessed when they mourn when they enter into the pain and the heartbreak of this world. We live in a world of great wonder and beauty, then so much to celebrate and enjoy. There's fabulous things that happen all the time. But it's also a world of difficulty and conflict and tragedy and suffering and unfixables. Sorrow can show up in a heartbeat. And sometimes the only thing that makes sense to do is to grieve. In ancient cultures, people knew how to mourn. They did it really well. They tore their clothes. They poured ashes on their heads. They sat in the dirt and raised their voices in lament. Some cultures today still actually have professional wailers. Did you know that? However, we in the West don't seem to be quite as comfortable with grief. And often our first instinct is to run from pain or sadness and to try and block out whatever we find too hard to face. We seek all sorts of ways to escape or distract or numb ourselves from the realities of life. We drink a little bit too much or watch a few too many shows on Netflix or develop a dependency on food or pursue some retail therapy so easily available to us now online 24-7. We find our coping mechanisms, whatever they are, and our culture is always so faithfully there, ready to sell us things to help us to escape and numb and distract. But here's the thing, none of these things are designed to bring lasting comfort. At the bottom of the bottle, at the end of the block of chocolate, or when, when the binge-worthy series ends, or when the thrill of your shopping purchase arriving wears off, you're still stuck with the same problems. And if your heart breaks and you don't take the time to mourn, the pain only goes deeper. And then your sadness ends up leaking out in other ways. Anger, sarcasm, stress, illness, 
depression, compulsive activities and a whole lot of other things. I want you to think for a moment of a beach ball. If you're in a swimming pool or at the beach and you try to hold an inflated beach ball under the water for a period of time, what actually happens to it? Yeah, just pops out. What? It just it does it. You can't keep holding it down. So grief forced down will actually do the same. And it usually comes out when you least want it to. What if we could find a different way? What if instead of running from our pain, we could discover a truer and a longer lasting comfort? What would that be like for us? In the words of Mark Scandrett, Jesus always invites us to confront our distorted responses to life and to return to what is most real and true. And with profound wisdom in this beatitude, he invites us to stop running from pain and sadness. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Adele Alberg Calhoun writes this, Learning what to do with our pain and our grief is a large part of the Christian journey. Culture says, buck up, get a grip, control your emotions, don't feel, don't talk, stuff the pain, pretend, medicate if you have to, but just get over it and move on. Christian culture can say, if you are full of faith, you won't get hurt, confused or discouraged. You won't feel hopeless or have a life filled with pain and loss. This myth doesn't do justice to our lives, to scripture or to the life of Jesus. Sometimes I think the church has unhelpfully created a space where we think we're not allowed to be sad or disappointed or mourn or lament. And that if we do, it means that we're not trusting God enough or our faith is too small or we're not Christian enough. Or sometimes it's simply that we don't want people to know that we're struggling. It's a bit of a pride thing. I recently had someone say to me, you've got to put on your church face to come to church, right? And I distinctly remember another Sunday morning when I asked someone how they were as they were leaving. They, they, they just answered and it was genuine and it was beautiful. But they said, okay, but I guess I have to be, don't I? I disagreed <laughs> and said, I think it's okay to not be okay. And after I'd said that, their eyes welled up with tears and the tears started running down their face and they shared about a really significant loss they had been through that week. She needed to be mourning. Hearing things like that breaks my heart and it actually really frustrates me because I don't think that that space that we've somehow created reflects the heart of Jesus at all. Of course, we do read verses in the Bible like, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. James 1, 2. Philippians 4, 4 says, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. It's there. It's God's word. But there is a deep and sacred faith walk that those who grieve must go through. You can't rush along your pain. The only way through grief is through it. People need time to walk in the darkness, holding God's hand for long enough to believe that all will be well again. And when they walk well and at the pace they need to and receive the comfort of Jesus, they usually come to a place of saying, God, you are still good. I will still follow you. Rejoice in the Lord. It is well with my soul. But it's a journey. And it's usually in hindsight as we've experienced a new intimacy with God through those dark moments and our troubles. And after we can see how it's grown us, that then the purposeful things are seen. And men, I'm speaking to you, can I super carefully say, and without boxing you all into this category, because I know it's not right for everyone, but we know that some of you don't cry or express sadness as easily as us women. Our brains are bathed in estrogen. We have a hormonal advantage. It helps us express our emotions more easily. And oh, we have so many of them, don't we? <laughs> The men kind of nodding there. <laughs> I have a sneaking suspicion, men, though, that you still feel the emotions. 
Sometimes, perhaps, though, you find ways to suppress them. Because at times our Western culture has wrongly told our precious men that it's not manly to cry, or it's a sign of weakness, and you have to be strong. With both of those things that I've just mentioned, I think of my own beautiful dad, whose life was shattered at the age of 20. In an instant, he lost his gorgeous mum and his beloved little brother and sister in a car accident when they collided with a train because the sun had blocked their view. His father, another brother and sister were all seriously injured in that. My dad was the only one of his family of seven who wasn't in that car that morning. And he went home to an empty house. And his life was never the same again. He was never given permission to grieve. Back in 1960, you just got on with it. Resilient generation. However, 60 years later... On the anniversary of that accident, the tears finally came for him. He just started to cry. He was 80. That grief couldn't be held down any longer. What a price to pay. 60 years of carrying grief that was that deep. My heart breaks at the thought of that weight that he carried for all of those decades. If you've been told or you think that you shouldn't grieve... Or cry. I have a two-word answer for you. Or perhaps it's an invitation. Jesus wept. John eleven thirty five. It's the shortest verse in the Bible, but boy, it's powerful. And it helps us to reimagine the possibilities of life with God. In John 11, we read about the death of Jesus' friend Lazarus and the reactions of his sisters, Martha and Mary. So let's start reading from verse 28. After she, that's Martha, had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and he's asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how much he loved him. All three of these siblings were very dear friends of Jesus. And when Jesus finally arrives, he's met by a devastated Martha and Mary falls at his feet sobbing. Several of their friends follow suit and tears start streaming down their faces. And we read that when Jesus saw Mary weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And then it was his turn Two verses later, we read that Jesus weeps, not just cries, but weeps. And so openly that the crowd of friends and family actually said, see how much he loved him. Don't miss the significance of this. Jesus knew what he was going to do next. He knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He can see the bigger picture. Yet, in this moment, he still weeps. Perhaps that tells us something important about the nature of grief and hope, that they are not opposites. Perhaps they can actually exist together. And that hope, real hope, is large enough to hold our grief without crumbling under the weight of it. Real hope knows how to sit with pain and make space for it. I find these words of Aaron Smith so insightful. He says, Jesus weeps with Mary. He sits with her, holding space for her grief, her lamentation, her sorrow. He doesn't say, it's going to be okay. He doesn't offer some quip that everything happens for a reason or that Lazarus is in a better place. No, Jesus sits in the ashes with Mary, weeping with her. He holds space for her feelings, knowing that she can believe that all will be well at another time. 
Now is the time for sorrow to run its course. Jesus sits with Mary compassionately and empathetically weeps with her in front of Lazarus' tomb. How beautiful is that? We follow a Jesus who will let us cry at his feet. He doesn't expect you to just be okay and get over it and be able to say, it's all joy, count it all joy. He just doesn't do that. He's deeply invested in you. He's profoundly moved by what you're going through. And he chooses to sit with you. I wonder if you've ever stumbled across a little verse tucked away in Psalm 56, 8 that tells us that we have a God who counts every tear. The Message Bible paraphrases it like this. You've kept track of my every toss and turn through sleepless nights. Each tear entered in your ledger, each ache written in your book. This beatitude is significant for us. It gives us permission to grieve. It allows us to enter into the sadness and the sorrow of the world that we find ourselves in and not suppress it or hide it or to try and comfort or isolate ourselves by running away from it in ways that simply just don't last. Jesus gives us permission to go beyond everything's okay and actually honestly say, that's heartbreaking, that hurts really struggling and he invites us to bring it to him to have the courage to name it to sit with it to weep and to experience his comfort whether you are mourning the state of your own soul or the things that you see happening in the world I wonder if you're mourning today are you sad about something are you grieving the death of someone dear to you a miscarriage a wayward child a challenging health diagnosis or ongoing illness, a shattered dream, a struggling marriage, your unwelcome companion anxiety that now follows you around, a fractured relationship, changes in your body or mind as you age, the loss of a pet, your relationship status, perhaps your singleness, the uncertainty of your future, hurt, disappointment, wounds that are caused by others, regret, a seemingly impossible situation that seems to have no light at the end of the tunnel, personal suffering, a long season of hardship, maybe you've still got COVID season stuff just sitting under the surface there for you. It's the loss of anything dear to you. Where there is loss, there's grief. Let me ask you another question. When you look at the world around you, what breaks your heart? It would be so interesting to have the time to allow people to speak out those things in this room today and to be able to hear what's breaking each other's hearts. What about you? What feels broken in you? Where are you aching? Do you feel loneliness? Pain, disappointment, loss. Maybe you're grieving over your own spiritual state. You can see that you haven't been right with God and you're sorry for what you've done. And you're shedding tears right now rather than making excuses for it or blaming other people for it. That's a good thing. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Being sad over your sin is so much better than being flippant over it. Can I also just say that grief is not a competition. Whatever causes your sadness needn't be compared with anyone else. And your journey through grief is also going to be really unique to you. Everyone's experience is going to be slightly different. So to those of you here who are grieving something today... Those of you who may be sitting there with a lump in your throat right now, I want to look you in the eye as much as that's possible from up here. And I want to say, it's okay. What you're feeling is okay. You don't have to hide your emotions. It doesn't mean that your faith is weak or that your hope has failed. 
And God is not frustrated that you are sad or grieving. You don't have to pretend it's not happening. Jesus welcomes mourning. And as he did on the hill that day in that mass of raw humanity and people going through hard stuff, he actually says, Makarios, blessed are you, congratulations, right on, way to go. Because you are vulnerable enough to enter into the pain and the heartbreak of this world and feel the sadness of it. And as we take our loss and our pain and our disappointment to Jesus, we don't find someone who heaps condemnation or shame on us. He just doesn't do that. Jesus has been there. He knows what it's like. Scripture calls him a man of suffering and familiar with pain. That's in Isaiah 53, 3. And his promise to us, if we'll step into this and lean into mourning, rather than trying to self-protect our hearts and run away from it, is that we will be comforted. I love the good old dictionary definition of comfort. It's actually very enlightening. A physical state, sorry, a state of physical ease and freedom from pain and restraint. And the easing or alleviation of a person's feeling of grief or distress. Jesus comforts the grieving heart. Psalm 147.3 says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Brokenness and pain are not the end of the story. And here's the beauty of the now and not yet of God's kingdom. And this is so good. So listen closely. In Revelation 21.4, we read, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. One day, God will wipe away every tear. Every sorrow will be behind us. That is in the future. We can look forward to that. But until that day, we do have a place to take our pain A place where we can experience the divine comfort of the Holy Spirit that brings peace when nothing else makes sense. That's the beauty of Emmanuel, God with us, and the beauty of the Holy Spirit, God within us. It's the Jesus way. We may not be able to understand it all, but a God small enough for our minds would not be big enough for our needs, yeah? Here now in the present, there's blessing for you. And for tomorrow, there is hope that one day, in the words of the Jesus Storybook Bible, all the sad things will become untrue. One day, Jesus will rule over every square inch and everything that God intended in the beginning. So live in the present in blessing and the future in hope. And for those of you not in a place of mourning today, you, dear friends, are invited in Romans 12, 15 to mourn with those who mourn. Let me pray. Jesus, those two words that we read in Scripture, Jesus wept, are two of the most heartbreaking and comforting words that we could hear that show us that you are familiar with pain and loss. We thank you that you are so tender with our grief and gentle with our sorrow that you hold us so close to your heart in the midst of our ache. And we thank you that you give us hope that our hurt won't last forever. Amen. Thank you for watching this message. We hope that it was inspiring and powerful and just what you needed at this moment. If you would like prayer or to find our sermon-based studies, please head to our website or check the description below for a link. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to share the video, like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for updates of when we release new videos. Remember, life can be tough, so let's do it together.